our own black men. Whatever your thoughts, your values and your, and your feelings are, remember this is the year forum when you have a chance to phone up and say what you think about the urban world that you live in. Kuwain, it takes place... I'm Jeff Schumann, and I believe there's a crisis for young black men on the streets of Britain. For over a decade, young black men have been killing each other in disproportionate numbers. My listeners are angry and frustrated. For some, the violence has created a state of emergency in the black community. One young black man a week is being killed. London, baby. I wanted to find out for myself why young black men are robbing, stabbing, and shooting each other on the street. I headed for Peckham, a part of South London, with one of the worst reputations for black on black crime, to talk to people who live with violence every day of their lives. I met up with 19 year old King on the Ellsbury estate. Violence is like a, an everyday thing, so all we do is just try to survive in the society that we live in, you see what I'm saying? Like the life expectancy for us here. It's really short because like, we don't think ahead like into the future because we feel we don't have one. You know what I'm saying? So we, all we're doing is just living day to day trying to survive. There's killings every day, man. There's so, killings every day here, yeah, man. And how are you killing each other? It's like guns, knives, you know anything we can get. Like the other day, I saw a brother getting his head like kicked in. Like, you see what I'm saying? Just because he, he stepped on someone's trainees, you see what I'm saying? Like, my brother, he, that's my brother out there, yeah? He got stabbed, yeah, just for, like, the fact that they thought he was someone else. You see what I'm saying? How old's your brother? My, bro my brother, um, he's two years younger than me. He's um, 17. You get me? And, like, he got stabbed because they thought, like, he was someone else. You see what I'm saying? They just stabbed him because they thought he was someone else. So, and no one reported that. No one reported that. You didn't hear that on the news. A lot of people assume that most of the violence is connected to drug dealing, but it's worse than that. It's just a normal part of their lives. People think that us youths, yeah, us young black children, that we want to go and stab people and we don't want to do that. None of us would think that we've been brought up, like our parents have brought up, like, good, get me. But then it comes to, the, it comes to a point where you have to, you have to protect yourself. So you're going to have to go wherever means it is to protect yourself. I've been in circumstances where like, I'm just walking down the street, yeah? Just walking down the street, minding my own business, ain't done nothing to anyone. And someone just moves it. Someone just come, draw a knife on me, you know what I'm saying? Like, what? You see what I'm saying? No, no reason. No reason. And me personally, I've been through so much things. I've been rushed, I've been this, I've been that. I've been through so much, yeah. And I don't even know why these things have happened to me, do you know what I'm saying? I don't even know why, because I grew up in a way that I didn't, I didn't, need, to, I didn't need to trouble no one. Then all these things started happening to me, so I thought to myself, wait a minute, like, what's going on, like? Why is it happening to me? I might as well start going into that frame of mind and starting protecting myself, carrying what I need to carry and doing what I need to do, do you know what I'm saying? Good people are turning bad every day because this is what we're being forced to do. All I can say is right now, everyone that's living in South London here, yeah, I just say most children, they're dragged into it. Like, it's not that, that individual's bad. None of us are bad. Yeah. None of us are bad. Although they feel trapped in a cycle of violence, King and his friends understand their situation far better than I expected. We just want to escape this place, you see what I'm saying? Because mm. we're thinking like, What's the sense yeah, in this? you taking us? Where, where are we going? You see what I'm saying? We're just going around in circles, generation after generation. Uh, go to school for a bit, get excluded, get shot and dead. You see what I'm saying? So what's Sick. the point? One of King's friends, Colin Igwe, street named Menda, was stabbed to death in Peckham by a gang of youths just six weeks ago. No one's been charged with his murder. Colin was 18 years old. He left behind a nine-month-old baby. I'm suffering because of the death of my son. But deep down here, we're all mourning and crying every day. It's a song we all loved and cherished, right? I know it could happen to other people. I know it's been happening to other people as well. Youth of today, please stop killing one another. Stop killing one another. Blacks, stop killing your fellow brothers and sisters. When you talk of death, you, you, you feel pain. But when you lost your own flesh and blood, For King and his friends, Colin's death didn't seem to matter to the authorities. Personally, I think he didn't get enough coverage because one, to them, he was a thug, a 19-year-old thug from the streets. But Damilola Taylor was a little boy. 
and they don't look at little boys as fucks. But when I got stabbed, then I was just another gangster, innit? I My deserved it. I got stabbed. I deserved it. What, what, what newspaper reported that situation? I was just another gangster. And if I would have died for that, now I'm thinking to myself, like, what would have happened? Who would have cared? Who would have cared? Who would have died for nothing? Do you get what I'm saying? Nothing. Another black death. That's all they see it. Another black boy off the streets. The reality of life on the streets for King Henry's crew in Peckham is the philosophy of kill or be killed. And it's not just shootings to the problem. Every day there are scores of stabbings and robberies. Another of King's friends whom I met on the Ellsbury estate had been robbed by two youths at gunpoint just the night before. So two of them grabbed me and two of them grabbed my friend on the corner. And just right here actually. One of them put a knife by my neck and next other boy put a gun on my other side asking me what I've got in my pockets, anything. Next thing I know, the boy's gone straight to my pockets. And I just gave him the phone, I just gave him my new phone and everything. Because I thought, I don't want to lose my life over a little phone like that. They nearly cut my finger because they're trying to take my ring off. I just think it to my head, like, in my head, like, why did they do this, like, for a phone they're actually using guns now? Shut. When this happens to people, yeah, around my age, they're going to be like, Anything, I'm going to carry a weapon, I'm going to carry a gun, like, just for protection. And, like, that's, that's what really hurts, like, inside. In a survey for dispatches, we spoke to over 100 young men aged between 15 and 23, living in four inner city areas of London. The scale of the violence they described was horrific. 46% had been involved in a violent incident in the previous 12 months, either as victims or perpetrators. Just over half said they personally knew someone who carried a gun. 14% claimed they'd been shot at. This is the remand crew in Hackney. I believe you lost friends to violence, lost their lives or, or had friends hospitalised because of violence. It's not too long that I lost a close friend that got, sh got shot. It took 50, uh, 53 minutes for ambulance to come. So he died before he made it to hospital? Basically, yeah, yeah. Before you got there, yeah. When they hear it's a black shooting, they'll take forever to come. I'm gonna... A black and black crime, same thing, same day, another shooting, another black boy dead. That's the thing. That's care. why a lot of black guys do not go to the police. Yo, if you say you're from Hackney, I swear they don't uh... care. They don't care about your life. I swear them. Don't you worry for your own lives? I'm fine. Every day. I just want to make money. Live it large. And get out of here. Sus. Get out of here. There's the next three brothers from Roman crew. They told me belonging to a gang is a way of protecting each other, but it means they're a target for other black youths when they stray out of their own area. Is it safe for you guys to travel to different areas, different parts of London? When, when you're with Satan, yeah. When you're... When you've got Tommy by the yeah, side, yeah, you yeah, get yeah, me? Yeah, when Tommy... Tom, feel safe, you feel safe. Tommy has a gun. You know what it is? Nowadays, everyone's got one. Everyone has got... Everyone has got a gun. That's... It's easy to get a gun, everyone has got one. These youths see Hackney as a ghetto, a place that's been abandoned by the government and the rest of society. They say the streets are dangerous and there are no jobs. The government's got to come down there and see how it is. They need to, they need to spend a day, spend a day in the hood. No, no, no. But the government would say that there are jobs out there. There are jobs out there. It's you guys and your attitudes that makes you not want to go looking for work. You're happy to be comfortable. You're happy to be lazy. You're happy to be aggressive. You're happy to be dangerous with each other. What do you say to them? That's bro? bullshit. <laughs> the government, listen, if you're watching... Yeah. <laughs> listen, yeah? You don't know what's going on around here. Tell it's all about you to get a job. There's kids out there that's not in school. There's kids selling drugs. There's kids busting shots. There's people rolling around in straps. Thing they know, you don't know, you don't have a clue. Serious, you don't have a clue. I witness violence every day of my life, you don't have a clue. This road is known as Murder Mile. It runs through Hackney, and in the last three years, nine people have been murdered here. I've lost, I've lost three friends, that. One close, close one, that. He, he got taken out, that. Every day I think about him, man. Why was he killed? Because of a, a beef between two, two manners that don't really get along. How was he, how was he taken out? He, he, got, he got shot a couple times. Someone rolled up on him, like, put, 
put a couple in him, man. Cause he, he, he was young as well, like, you know, he's not even 20. He never, he's not even 20 yet. Drugs and poverty are a lethal combination. In Hackney, even young children sell cannabis. In the streets, it's called shotting. The risks of being violently robbed are huge. Young people, like, people, sh people shotting at 13, 13, 14, like, they're not built for it, like. Unknown people to, like, selling, selling it, and they get robbed and stabbed up. I have known certain brothers that, that uh, he's died, he's died because he was selling, selling drugs. I've seen it, like, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen bundles of money made within, like, two and a half hours. Bundles of it, which more than someone will make within a month, like, that's, that's what's tempting, that is, that's tempting. If it's there, it's tempting. Yeah. So a lot of people live for now. That's what it is. a lot of people live for now instead of down the line. A quarter of black youths are unemployed in Hackney. That's double the rate of white youth unemployment. Not every victim of black on black violence is in a gang or involved with drugs. 18-year-old Seeker Michaels was shot outside his mother's house in Dulwich, South London, now, in March of this year. We will remember the past 18 years, and we will smile. I love you, my brother. Seeker's mother, Vivian, a social worker, had passed her son in the street on the way back from church around 10.30 in the evening. When I came back, he was sitting in his car listening to music, and I stopped, smiled at him, he waved at me, smiled at me. About 10 minutes later, I had shouting, they shot him, they shot him. I did not believe that Seeker will, uh, will die. It never crossed my mind. I can't seem to bring up myself to believe that I'm not going to talk to him again, or he's not going to make me a cup of tea, or I'm not going to see that smile. The tragedy for Seeker's family is that he'd often spoken about his fear of dying violently. Sika was quite concerned and worried about street crime and Sika was really quite scared because he wouldn't even want to go on the train on his own. He was very scared and that worries me and that's the anger that I feel what rights anybody had to put my child through that. Nobody has any right to do that and I am sure that there are people out there who will know the men that perpetrate this evil uh, and the young men uh, that perpetrate such evil in society, they should be given up, they should, they, they should report them. Do you think the black community comes forward enough when there are shootings or incidents of serious crime? The black community as well need to take a response, form of responsibility. Because how long do we want to say, I am scared, we are afraid? If we don't stand up to that and keep waiting for the government to do something, then it might be too late and we might have to pay too dearly for it. It might sound quite harsh, but I do sincerely feel it's a form of ethnic cleansing. And, and if young black people are being killed on a daily basis, then we are actually wiping up a whole generation of, um, of black men. ...when no one is caught. I set off to Birmingham, where a double murder became national news when two teenage girls were shot to death on New Year's Day. 17-year-old Letitia Shakespeare and 18-year-old Charlene Ellis were caught in the crossfire between two rival North Birmingham gangs. For their mothers, it's been a painful reminder of the culture of the streets. I didn't expect me, um, Bev or Sandra to send our four daughters out on a New Year's night out. It was their first New Year's night out ever to go out and enjoy themselves and then to, just to get a phone call to say they've been shot dead. Um, they weren't involved in no form of gang. None of them, they weren't informed in no form of drugs, gangs, Nothing bad, they were just 
ordinary girls going to college. A part of me died when Letitia died. If you do not come forward after this, what is left? What could be worse? This is as bad as it gets. Please help. Please help. But 10 months on, it's the same old story. No one's prepared to give evidence in court. The silence continues. Grief has now turned to anger. And the hardest part, what gets me, is that people actually saw that night what actually happened. And a lot of people are saying, well, it's got nothing to do with me. Oh, I don't know them. Oh, I don't have to say nothing. But what a lot of people need to wake up and open their eyes and see that it could be them tomorrow in the same position unless they stand up and be counted. There were around 30 potential eyewitnesses outside the party when Charlene and Letitia died in a hail of bullets. But no one has come forward, and the mother's only hope is a campaign aimed at breaking the wall of silence within the black community. It's not about um, informing. Um, a lot of youth out there have got this thing about informing. It's not about informing, it's about coming together and saying enough is enough. It's a matter of saving. Saving someone's life or one of their lives. The only way these things are going to stop is when the community can stand up and say, no, we're not having this in our communities. We want um, our kids to be able to go out there and feel safe, um, not being shot. We don't want drugs in our community. That's what we're trying to do within our campaign. Letitia and Charlene's mothers feel betrayed, both by those who have information and have failed to come forward, and by local activists who, in the aftermath of their daughter's killings, describe themselves as black community leaders. I didn't know about no community leaders until January the 2nd. And if they was working so hard, why wait till now to say they're community leaders? I didn't know nothing about no community leaders. There's been a lot of shootings even since our daughters got murdered. There's still been a lot of shootings. Um, nothing's been done as far as we're concerned. Um, we're quite angry that in the beginning everyone came and said they was going to do this and they was going to do that. But at the moment, Not we've had no feedback on what's been done. The West Midlands Police have responded to the murders of Charlene and Letitia by significantly increasing the numbers of armed officers. Its Chief Constable, Paul Scott Lee, is quoted as saying, I run the biggest gang in the West Midlands. My gang is 12,000 strong, and I've got more guns and more ammunition than any other gangs. The police have had some success. Violent offences in Birmingham have gone down by 5% since January this year. Bombs, Whatever the police response to the shootings in Birmingham, the youths I met would never turn to the police for help. If one of your gang got killed and you knew who it was, would you go to the police or would you deal with it yourselves? Do it yourself. It's not a gang. It's not a gang, though. Oh, it's not a gang. Brethren, the close brethren. One of your friends get killed. You know he's killed him. What are you telling the police? Oh, the police can do lock away. You want to see the man get locked away? Someone comes and takes one of your family's life. You don't want to take. You ain't gonna stand by that. And on top of that, you know who done it as well, and you know they're running around laughing. You know. You're gonna be angry. You're gonna be upset. Obviously, you're gonna want revenge. That's how it goes. Yeah. What goes around comes around. Is that really what it is? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? That's what happens. That's what happens. That's what happens. That's how we live in. It's not meant to be like that, but that's that's our mum never taught us like that. Our mum's brought us up properly, you get me? They never brought us up to kill or nothing like that. They brought us up to live lovely and share together, you get me? Then what's happened? What's happened streets. is streets, isn't it? Street, Street life. Is, is there anything that you can see or feel can make a difference to change the streets? Nah. nah. Police can't change it either. Try to put more police so, on the hey, streets. Hey, 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 we got cars, we got cars, they've got guns, we got Black, guns. It's just the stupid. <laughs> <laughs> They're the biggest gang. Yeah. Yeah. These young men told me that they are not frightened of tougher policing and that nothing has changed in Aston, North Birmingham, since the murders of Letitia and Charlene. Sometimes you have to think what's the options. You wake up in the morning, you come out of your house, I mean, if you're living on your own, 
come out of your house, probably you ain't even eating in the morning. You think, what are you going to do? Go out, look for a job if they're saying, no, there's no work. It's going to stay like this, man. This no one will give a f about Aston. Worldwide. 54 million pounds was allocated by the government for the Aston area to improve the lives of the residents. Three years on, only five million pounds has been spent. Much of that on CCTV cameras and bulletproof windows for shops. Over half a million pounds was spent on consultants and bureaucrats. Doreen Bailey, a local Crown Prosecution Service lawyer, put in a bid for some of that money on behalf of the young people in the Aston area. We um, consulted a number of youths and organisations, youth centres. Within a number of weeks, we came back with information where the young people told us that they wanted various things to happen in the community. They wanted a say in how their community was run. They also wanted to have more funding spent in the area to allow them to, to do educational and entertaining events on a regular basis. Doreen submitted a detailed proposal in February this year asking for three quarters of a million pounds to fund youth projects. Eight months on, they're still waiting to hear. As far as the wishes of the young people are concerned, they have not been fulfilled. Doreen, what is the future for these young people? What's at stake? Unless we effect change, and that's radical change, the future of these young people look very bleak. We've seen so many shootings of our, in our black community already, and it will continue. We need um, to educate children. We need to make them feel as if they belong, they're part of society. They need to be mainstreamed instead of marginalised. With each high-profile shooting comes the promises of money and change. In the aftermath of the murder of Damilola Taylor in Peckham, the tower blocks where he lived were knocked down and replaced with low-rise housing. But for the youths who live on the nearby Ellsbury estate, the changes in the area are simply cosmetic. Has much changed since the death of Damilola? Not around here, around in Peckham, yeah. They just got like a, a better library and a, um, a little centre that they dedicated to Damilola. But, not, they, I mean, it's still the same atmosphere, but it's just that they got nicer buildings now, isn't it? Yeah. Tony Blair come here saying, ah, oh, I'm going to give money, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. No one's ever heard of him again. After the the money, day, apparently, the money he supposedly gave, where's the money? I don't see it. There ain't no refurbishments going on. Oh, we're still living in this run, these run-down areas with graffiti all over the building. Tony Blair says, ah, oh, he's going to give this much for crime. He's going to do this. He's going to stop this. He's going to stop that. But he needs to stop and ask why crime is going on in the first place. Why, those why people are on the street doing what they're doing? In terms of responses to the problem of black-on-black -black violence, providing a new AstroTurf pitch might seem a low priority. But for King, such a small gesture could make a significant difference. This is what I'm talking about, you know. This is the famous Burgess Park AstroTurf. Look, look at this. <laughs> this is a joke thing, you see what I'm saying? This is our playground. This is all we've got. This is our AstroTurf. Look at it. When was the last time we played here? About seven years ago, wasn't it? Seven years ago. So yeah, man, this is our playground. It just shows, it just demonstrates that no one gives a damn. Just as in Birmingham, the Ellsbury estate was promised over £50 million three years ago as part of the government's New Deals for Communities initiative. There's a porter cabin on the estate, which is meant to make it easier for residents to put in bids for this money. I went to find Norma Hibbert, who chairs one of the tenants' associations, to see if she was happy with what the money had been spent on. Young people that I've met who live on this estate, who surely some of that money's earmarked for, I have no idea about New Deals for Community. Well, I'm not surprised about that. Not many people have any idea about New Deals for Community. I've heard people say it's a nightclub. I've been living on this estate now for six years. When Mr Blair came here back in 98, he decided that this place was impoverished and in need of help and assistance. And so they voted some, what, 56.2 million to help to improve the quality of the estate, to improve the quality of life of the residents of the estate. And to date, you know, four years into this project and nothing has happened.
you know, the physical environment hasn't improved. Some projects have been funded, but it's a lot of effort trying to get your projects funded. We're told there's about 46 or 47 million pounds left, but as to what has been spent and where it's been spent, we have no idea. In the meantime, it falls to individuals in the community to find their own ways to help the youth. King had told me about Rose, the mother of one of his friends. She used to rent a large hall for them to gather in, fed them, and help them sort out their problems. But because she can't afford to pay the rent anymore, they are now meeting in her home. Hello, girls. Hello, Rose. How are you? Fine, thank you. What is it that drives you and makes you the person that you are? Love. I just love these youths. When you love them, you want to do everything for them. You see somebody's child on the street doing evil, you just want to go there and grab that child and say, come and be with me. Don't do this. Just love them. When you have that natural love for the youth, you will, do, you will go extra mile, you know. I spend my own personal money, you know, to gather this youth, to get food for them. It is love, you know. Is it, is it fair to say that there is a parental crisis? in the black community yeah, and in this Yeah, I the information. From the youth, they say their parents, some of their parents have neglected them. They are so poor, their parents are not there for them. And, you know, these are some of the things that take them out on the street there, you know, to thieve, to carry guns, to kill, to go to pubs, to sell drugs. But, you know, it, it's, it's time for us to come back home and bring our children together. Come on, let's sit down, please. Young Rose acts as a surrogate mother to many of these young men. So do you think uh, some of the parents push you kids to do what you don't want to do? No. It's not, it's not that. that. It's like, it's just that, that they, they don't, don't know. They don't, they don't live on the streets. Street. They don't see what happens to us. But they don't really know what's going on here. I felt frustrated that people like Rose were struggling on without any help from anyone. I went to see Trevor Phillips, head of the Commission for Racial Equality. Did he think the black community was doing enough to support our young people and speak out about the violence? People feel there's almost a wall of silence, a wall of shame, self-appointed and so-called black community leaders. Yeah. Whilst they're very, very vocal on racism, yeah. they're not critical enough of things that are tearing apart the black community. Where are these so-called leaders tackling the kind of issues in our community? I think there are a lot of people who get um a lot of pleasure and also make a decent living out of telling white people how guilty they ought to feel. Now, I have no qualms about saying I think that there are things wrong with the system. But I think you also have to say, you know, we are not children. We are not babies. We're not slaves anymore in other people's hands. We have things that we can and ought to do for ourselves. What are some of these things, Trevor, that we should be doing to deliver a better life for ourselves? We've got to stop doing some of the things that we do. Ignoring our children, letting them down, walking away from them when we've made them. Uh, and I'm talking about black men particularly here. Two-thirds of, uh, of the poorest black families or less well-off black families are headed by a single woman. Now, these women are left to bring up boys on their own. And if you look, if you look at the graph of black boys' achievement, where does it fall? Where do they fall away? Round about the age of seven, eight, nine, where any psychologist, and, and you know as a teacher, will tell you this is where a boy is just getting into that difficult phase, doesn't know where he's going, it's going to be rough. He needs a father. I don't know what you Most of the youths I spoke to said they saw their gang as their family. In the absence of other father figures, youths looked up to older gang members. Their other role models were rap or hip-hop musicians. The pressures to live up to the bling bling image are great. Many youths we spoke to had robbed or been robbed for jewellery and designer trainers. There's been endless debate about how much and whether violent lyrics influence youth behaviour. In our survey, just over half the youth we spoke to, 53%, said violent lyrics did affect their behaviour. Like some boys our age, you know, listen to rap tunes and 
go they nuts. switch. They just switch. They go nuts for real. They switch. Yeah. Wow. They just go. That's nang blood. I'm going on road to bust that. You get me? Yeah. I'm a tag driver at North West London tonight. 50 cents has come into the country. Uh, 50 cents is the bad boy rapper who's come good from New York. He says he's been shot nine times. He lives what's called the bling bling lifestyle. Champagne, cars, fast women. And I just want to kind of find out why he's a hero to many, if at all. Black on black violence sells. Hip hop, rap and garage music is now a multi-billion dollar industry. In our survey, almost 46% of youths said they were more likely to buy an artist's music if, like 50 Cent, they had direct experience of street violence. Some of it, yeah, could be about his life, but the most of the music was about girls, money, cash. That was what people sell on the street. There's too many fake rappers here. Yeah? Well, they're inhabiting our streets. Yeah. They're inhabiting our streets. 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 They're for those at the sharp end, the music doesn't just reflect their lives, it glamorizes it and reinforces their attitudes. I blaze marijuana, step to your manor, jack you and your mother. You want beef, step to my manor. Nigga like me give you stone cold stunner, bad boy killer. I'm the one with the fucked up bandana right in the manner. The connection between music and black on black violence is not just about the lyrics. Around one in six gun related murders in London happen in or around nightclubs. Even so, security is often lax, as these rappers from Hackney, the East Connection, told me. Everybody around that is a security, they, they, weren't, dropped, they weren't dropped out of the sky and say, yeah, you're security. Then people like us. It's like I know these guys. I'm a if I turn to security now, I'm still me. You know what I'm saying? I'm still shizzle. Like. Huh? Because these guys are my friends. If they phone me and say, boy, there's a rave going on tonight, certain boys down there try to disrespect me, and I'm coming there, I want you to sort me out and just let me come in with sign. I'm going to lift him and just leave, no problem. Because he's my friend and I know this guy disrespect him, I'm going to let him in. Some clubs take their responsibilities seriously. And like this one, have metal detectors and thorough searches but not all of them. I've met all the detectives everywhere that. Like, it's just a pattern on search. I'll go into some maze where it's just like, go, like, like, I thought to myself, I could have had something, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or like, I've been to a place, thing. there weren't even no pattern, like. I went there, I see one woman, and she said to me, crutch search. She started feeling man's thing, like, I was like, what? I was jamming there, and I was looking yeah. around, and all my friends were like, yeah. And I just went in, that was it. It's because some of the venues, the people that got on the door, the two, you know, mellow. Friendly Woman was on some different vibes, start grab man thing. I was like, yeah, it's real in the field. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's mad though, man. You know, need no, to get not, people but, that are yeah, but it, it dedicated it to the job, people like... that's come to work. In April this year, 26-year-old Jason Fearon died after about eight men barged past security into a North London nightclub. Jason ran out and tried to escape, but was pursued by gunmen in a BMW. Shots were fired. The police later found Jason in the passenger seat of this car with a bullet wound in his head. So far, no one has been charged. I've come to visit Jason's mother. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Come in. So where were you when you got the news? I was in my bed. It was about 10 to 4 in the morning, and the phone rang, and it was Jason's girlfriend to say um, Jason's been shot. Are you angry that people must have witnessed who killed your son? What, how did that make you feel that people have not come forward? Very, very, I'm very saddened by it for the simple reason that, you know, if we're gonna stop this from happening again, people who've seen things need to say that they've, what they've seen, you know, you're not, you're not an informer, you're not a grass, you're just doing the right thing. Do you think the killer of Jason will ever be caught? I pray. Every night I go to my bed, every morning I wake up, I pray that I'm going to hear some good news, that the person who's killed my son is caught and, is, and gets punished. Yet again, a wall of silence is hampering the investigation into the murder of a young black man. 
Operation Trident, which deals with black-on-black -black shootings in London, faces this problem all the time. One of its responses has been to launch a poster campaign to encourage young people to call crime stoppers and pass on information in confidence. But it seems they have a long way to go to convince the youths we spoke to. If you saw this, if you, if you saw this, what, what does this mean to you? What, is, what, what does it mean? What is, so you, all that number, you're a snitch. You can't snitch right there. From a young snitch person's point of view, yeah, they ain't really going to call that. that. Really if, if, if they have a black ute there with a headphone, they're going to listen to. So what would make you... What would make you... No, I don't know, you know, but that won't. Have you ever seen these posters? What does it mean? What, what, what do they mean to you? It's bullshit. I can see what they're trying to say, what the message they're trying to give out, but to me, it's just like, it's not changing nothing. I know it might take a bit of time, but what is a poster going to do? Certain men are shooting next man can't even read. You know what I'm saying? I went to meet the Metropolitan Police Commander in charge of Operation Trident to find out how successful she thought the campaign had been. What we have to do is um, reach out and uh, talk in a way that um, these young people actually can relate to. And I don't think we've all, always been uh, that good at that. I myself, I'll see it and just walk past it. Yeah, I'll read it, but with the If you've seen your bedroom get shot, yeah, you don't really go to the police, you want to get revenge yourself. Yeah. We now um, use all, all kinds of different um, groups of people, including uh, independent advisors, people like yourself, people who've worked on the streets, um, to, to um, actually communicate with young people in a variety of different ways to say, you know, this police service, this London Metropolitan Police Service is your service and it is for you. No one's going to report it. You'll be wasting your credit. <laughs> I will not tell the police. I would not. That's I would not tell the police. The most I will do put, is ring ambulance. I'll, I'll put the boy on my shoulder, take him to the hospital. When he gets sorted out, we'll go and do what we're doing. That's what I say. We have found in the last a couple of years that more and more people are prepared to say no to guns and more and more people are prepared to come forward and give evidence. And, and this campaign is designed to, to encourage more of that. The truth is, Operation Trident does claim considerable success. Clear up rates for murders have risen from 20% to 70%, and well over 100 guns have been taken off the streets. But there's still a long way to go. What are the solutions for us all to move forward for the future? One thing's for sure, it's not going to be solved by the police alone. For a young man to pick up a gun and shoot somebody, that's not something that happens overnight. The vast majority of our offenders um, are very poorly educated, have very uh, low expectations of employment, uh, very low expectations of what life um, has to hold for them. So education uh, is key. As a former teacher, my passion is education. I left teaching 10 years ago because of my frustration that so many talented black youths were being excluded. But not much has changed. I've come back to the estate I visited in Hackney to ask the youths about their experiences of school. You are nice and safe? How are you finding school? Alright. Don't want to teach us? Some teachers. Do you like school? Do Yeah? Ever get in trouble in school? You're okay all the time? Most of the time. Most of the time you get in trouble, yeah? Why? <laughs> Having fights. What do you want to be? I want to be a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> you, won't many, you won't have many friends left. So cut that bit, cut that bit, cut that bit. <laughs> <laughs> the level of black underachievement in our schools is staggering. Here in Hackney, only 7% of black children get five or more decent GCSEs less than a quarter of the national average. And nationally, Afro-Caribbean children are still three times as likely as white kids to be permanently excluded from school. Did a number of your friends survive to year 11 or were many excluded before the end of their Ma time to take exams? Many were excluded. Many were excluded before year nine, before they got to year nine. Well, most of the people that I was in school with that are jammed with and that are in prison. But nine out of ten of them are in prison. Now. And it's not just in Hackney that black youths are critical of the education system. A lot of the times, black brothers just get kicked out, they get failed, you know? There was a, a guy in my school, a white guy, he was one of the worst behaved kids you would ever see. He used to spit at teachers, throw, da da da. And every, 
he never got kicked out. It was always he's got some sort of problem. They was always trying to find a problem, sending him to psychiatrist and um, sending him for counselling. It's always some problem. But with a black person, it's just down. Oh, he's a black kid. He's he's already the problem. So they just kick you out, you know. I think schools, in a way, are failing black kids. Because the system's been there for so long. Obviously, there's a problem. You know what I mean? Everyone, every black person is an individual, and they can't all be doing this. Can't be all doing the same like mistake. Obviously, there's something wrong. None of this is new to Professor Gus John, a former director of education in Hackney, and a leading expert on race, education, and crime. So, Gus, why is there such a crisis in schools in Britain right now? Uh, I think the situation is so appalling for a number of reasons. The first is that. Teachers in schools don't have too many high expectations of black kids. I think the teachers have become so used to the idea of children underachieving that they tend to concentrate on an expectation that the children would be misbehaving and that they're not teachable. And consequently, you have a situation where the children themselves simply mess around without very much discipline and can't be focused on learning. So if teachers do not understand children, if they have no concern at all about what the child experiences before coming into school, or for that matter, the range of pressures that are on that child in their home or in the community, they cannot begin to engage with them sufficiently to teach them anything. Gus is angry with schools for failing young black men, but he also finds fault with the black community itself for putting up with this shoddy service. Collectively, as a people, we have not done enough to demonstrate to the schools and to the government that this situation cannot be allowed to continue. If the level of failure and underachievement amongst black children were happening for white middle class families in this society, by now there would be an uproar. Every year you would be asking for the sacking of a Secretary of State for Education. I took Gus to meet King and his friends at Rose's house near Peckham in South London. Hello, Rose. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Um, this is Professor Gus John, one of the Hello. foremost Hello. leading Rose, black academics. He wanted to know how much the dangerous world they live in had affected their education. Were there discussions about guns, knives, gang violence, etc. in your school? No, no. They just said the art. If you're caught with a knife at school, you're kicked excluded out. for good, kicked out. But not once did they even actually ask the person why, why he's got the knife in the school. Because I know at one time when the police come in to say oh, knives are dangerous and that, he gave a, he gave he pr he practically thought it was a joke. Giving a joke is uh, there was one boy that he searched and he found a machete on him. Yeah. And when he asked the boy why the boy had a machete, he's like oh, because these thing was a group of boys was gonna they said that they're gonna kill me at the, after school, and he had no choice but to bring it in, and. Instead, of the, the officer listened and found it amusing or and the, arrested him still. Or the police will come Against the odds, many of these young men are now at college or university, despite the culture of violence they've grown up in. So, my, my, my older brother here, he got... Like, he went to the same primary school I did here, but he was, and secondary school, but he wasn't able to complete his GCSEs because the day he went to go and take his GCSEs, the, some boy there told him that if he would come in that day, they would kill him. So he wasn't able to take his GCSEs. So he lost all his GCSEs because of that. And like, if he was to say that to a teacher, she would think he's mad or something. Yeah, the teacher or... would say, ah, oh, too late, too late. The thing had been sent off already. So he, you get me? he's in a society yeah, where he's out of place because he doesn't fit in. He doesn't fit in that society where you go from secondary school to college to university because he doesn't have no GCSEs. When black boys are too scared to take exams, which could help them out of poverty, something's wrong. If you have young people in a school and around them in the community, there's this business of fear of crime, carrying knives, dealing with guns, being bullied into joining gangs, then that must be an issue for the school. The school cannot say it's got nothing to do with them. They can't send all of those children to pupil referral units and they can't exclude them all. I just kept getting the same message. It's a vicious circle of underachievement, lack of honest opportunities, violence and death. It all seems to come back to one thing. Does anyone really care enough about black boys killing each other? 
these young people believe that if it was young white people killing themselves in disproportionate levels, government would react far quicker. As it's young black men, the government has no solutions or any real issues or any real care. What's your view? Well, we take seriously all violent crime for whatever community. And that's why in the last year, the Home Secretary has been meeting with people from the communities at his round tables on gun crime to listen to what is needed. It's why earlier this year, we announced £1.5 million to go to communities to bid for money to support projects in their communities, but also for the Disarm Trust to support their activities in tackling these problems. We can do more, we will do more, but we are listening and we're trying to tackle this really serious and complex issue. These young people feel they're being talked around, they're not being spoken to. Well, if we're not getting uh, across to young people what we're doing in terms of education, what we're doing in terms of housing, what we're trying to do in terms of making sure all young people, and particularly black young people, get a chance at decent employment, then we need to try harder in getting those messages across. And if some of the young people aren't getting access to some of the services we are providing and some of the support we are, aren't, we are providing, we need to ask ourselves why not and tackle that. Um, I'm interested to hear what you've said for the programme. I can go back and think about how we we're engaging, we are engaging with community organisations, perhaps we need to make sure that we're engaging young people within those communities as well. It's going to take more than platitudes to deal with this crisis. Government, police and schools all have their role, as does the black community, in parenting, in guidance and speaking up when we've witnessed the murder. Until then, the killings will continue. Why? Why am I living in a society where are you for dying and being all our talents are wasting it away? We need to make a change and the government need to be aware instead of turning a blind eye as they usually and do. Same. The, the government should wake up and, 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 and hear the cry of the youth, right? We don't know what is in their mind. We don't know what motivates them to do these things. But we are appealing to the government to do something, to intervene because a lot of lives are being lost each and every, every day. What are they doing to help? What are they doing to help the youth? So, are black men the problem, or does society make them a problem? Tell us what you think at channel4.com slash black history map. Next on four, how those close to Stephen Lawrence have coped since his death 10 years ago. 